go. Two streams in a row. Welcome back. Uh, let's uh, figure out how to dive in again. Um, I did play around with uh, track stuff, but I didn't have a lot of time to set it up to look nice. Right now it looks pretty bad. Um, if I turn it on here, you can see it at the bottom, but I can't figure out how to make it look right. Um, <laughs> it looks terrible. So I got to figure out how to make it uh, to look better, but okay. Let's turn that back off. All right. Um, so what we were in the middle of doing was the function stuff and we actually have it in a state where I think it's not clean. Cargo check. Yeah. So we, we, we're not creating anything with this type. Um, so hopefully we're going to get to that. What we finished up, oh yeah, the thing we did, didn't do, I just threw this in here at the bottom. I think we're going to need to create this locks callable trait. As a, as, sorry, as a trait because this is an interface in, <clears throat> in the Java side of things. So I think... And I don't know if this is the right approach, but let's let's give it a shot. We can make this the um, I don't know, call it funk, and just say RC din locks callable. And then it's it obviously has a call thing. So you know what we should do is actually separate this out, right? Before I go too far with this, let's create a new file called callable and move all this in there like that and just have this imported so use create callable stuff right and then here we'll have the callable and the pub trait locks callable and it has a function which is called call it Gonna have to take a self and interpreter. Let's get rid of that extra blank line, and then um, arguments, which is gonna be a list, a vec, sorry, of object, um, which means we're gonna need to import object as well. And it returns. Um, I guess it's gonna do a result object or box result. And that'll be the trait that we implement. And then, um, okay, so use create object star, right? And then we'll say impl locks callable for callable. Um, oh, so we can't have this thing called call, right? So we don't actually need anything here, right? We just need to call function call self interpreter interpreter argue actually we're going to underscore these because we're not using them just oh no we're passing in law arguments back object result object locks result and that's just going to be self func call Right, we're going to call it on this guy. Interpreter arguments. So it just passes the call along. Like that. Um, oh. Could not find callables because we don't have it here. Right? Okay. And RC needs to be imported. Use standard RC RC. Oh, now it's good. Now we have to do function func call. So one more layer of indirection there. Oh, it's a private field. 
Um, I don't think we can call it that, right? So I'm thinking, what if we just call it call, but then call call can't call call? <laughs> Let's try it. Um, function, there's a funk in it, but if I say impl callable, which is just basically this, I don't think it's going to work, is it? If I make this pub, it still doesn't work. Oh, fuck. Right. And we can't do debug now. Oh. Clone and partial equal. Oh, clone clone is okay. It's just partial equal and debug. Okay, I guess we can write those. Impl debug for callable. Um, what does it need? Not a trait. It is a trait. Use core format debug. Yeah, now we don't have that. So we need a, oh, I thought it would tell me what the name of the function was. It should be format. Okay, yeah, there it is. So I think we already have one in object. We can just steal this line and put it here. And I guess we don't have anything yet. So write F callable. Just for now, and then we'll we'll put in something reasonable until we can get this. This is just a placeholder until we can get this to compile. And then the other one was partial equal, right? Uh, and I know that one's eq, and it takes a self and an other self, and returns a bool, a book, or a bool. And then uh, for this, I think we can just say rc pointer equal on the two pointers self dot funk and other dot funk right Is that simple oh we have to import format and partial oh yeah we don't want that oops i missed there it still doesn't like format. Expected result found. Oh, I put a semicolon. Okay. And what's wrong here? Oh, ampersands. There we go. Okay. And we still have two warnings, which means the funk is still not used, but we now have a trait that calls the thing that we were encapsulating. This is probably not the most elegant solution but it works and we have the trait so that's good so now we're looking at call type errors um, before we get into implementing locks callable we need to make the visit method a little more robust it currently ignores a couple of failure modes that we can't pretend won't occur first what happens if the callee isn't actually something you can call what if you try to do this totally out of function strings aren't callable in lock in locks. Runtime representation of a lock string is a Java string, so when we cast that to a locks callable, the JVM will throw a class cast exception. We don't want our interpreter to vomit out some nasty Java stack trace and die. Instead, we'll need to check the type ourselves first, and we do that now here. Um, we added this yesterday. I kind of peeked ahead right at the end of the stream just to see what goes in here. So we still throw an exception, but now we're throwing our own exception type, one that the interpreter knows to catch and report gracefully. Um, we're still not creating functions though, so we can't test that, right? If I say cargo run, can I test it? 
by saying foo parentheses. Oh yeah, look at that. Can only call functions in classes. And I want to fix this error thing. Because it's been bugging me the whole time. I have the line number and the um, line. There we go. I don't know what it said. It said in the text, and I don't want to go back and look for it. But git add source error. Git commit add line to error. Okay. okay. Checking arity. The other problem relates to the function's arity. Arity is a fancy term for the number of arguments a function or operation expects. Unary operators have arity one. Binary operators two. In functions, the arity is determined by the number of parameters it declares. So this has three. It expects three arguments. So what if you try to call it like this? Too many or too few? Different languages take different approaches to this problem. Of course, most statically typed languages check, at the, check this at compile time and refuse to compile the code if an argument count doesn't match the function's arity. JavaScript discards any extra arguments you pass. If you don't pass enough, it fills in the missing parameters with magic sort of like null, but not really value undefined. Python is stricter. It raises a runtime error if the argument list is too short or too long. I think the latter is the better approach. Passing the wrong number of arguments is almost always a bug, and it's a mistake I do in, make in practice. Given that, the sooner the implementation draws my attention to it, the better. So for locks, we'll take Python's approach. Before invoking the callable, we'll check to see if the argument list's length matches the callable's arity. All right, so we have this. Take a look at this here. So we, we're gonna have a, yeah, so we're adding this arity line to our interface. So, um, I can't pull it this way, source callable. Um, so the trait is going to have another function on it, function arity. It's going to take self and it's going to return a use size. Right, and now we're in the interpreter, we're going to look here. We're going to say if Right, arguments len is not equal to function func arity. Then we're going to run runtime error. Error, box result. Runtime error. Expert paren. Format, bang. Expected function arity arguments, but got that many and we'll do function dot func dot arity comma arguments dot let uh, I guess we have to return that okay otherwise we'll just call it and return the object or return an okay object and otherwise we'll return the error for the uh, the other one. Let's see if this works. Almost works. We need to add this here. Um, arity, self, new size. I guess. I guess we can put it here. Right, and just say return. Self arity. Oh, that doesn't quite work. What doesn't like? Oh, I need an ampersand there. Yeah, okay, that does it. Okay. So that was 10.1, but we're still not creating any functions. So that's going to be, I guess that's what we're going to do next is native functions. So git status, git source, git commit, section 10.1, function infrastructure because we can call functions but we don't we can't make them yet 
We could push the already checking into the concrete implementation of call, but since we'll have multiple classes implementing locks callable, that would end up with redundant validation spread across a few classes. Hoisting it up into the visit method lets us do, lets us do it in one place. All right, so native functions. We can theoretically call functions, but we have no functions to call yet. Right. Before we get to user-defined functions, now is a good time to introduce a vital but often overlooked facet of language implementations, native functions. These are functions that the interpreter exposes to user code, but that are implemented in the host language, in our case Java, not the language being implemented, locks. Curiously, two names for these functions, native and foreign, are antonyms. Maybe it depends on the perspective of the person choosing the term. If you think of yourself as living within a runtime's implementation, then functions written in that are native. But if you have the mindset of a user of your language, then the runtime is implementation in some other foreign language. Or it may be that native refers to the machine code language of the underlying hardware, and Java native methods are ones implemented in C or C++ and compiled into native machine code. Sometimes these are called primitives, external functions, or foreign functions. These, since these functions can be called while the user's program is running, they form part of the implementation's runtime. A lot of the programming language books gloss over these because they aren't conceptually interesting. They're mostly grunt work. But when it comes to making your language actually good at doing useful stuff, the native functions your implementation provides are key. They provide access to the fundamental services that all programs are defined in terms of. If you don't provide native functions to access the file system, the user's going to have a hell of a time writing a program that reads and displays a file. Classic native function almost every language provides is one to print text to standard out. In locks, I made print a built-in statement, right, so that we could get stuff on the screen in the chapters before this one. Once we have functions, we could simplify the language by tearing out the old print syntax and pre replacing it with a native function, but that would mean that examples early in the book won't run in the interpreter from later chapters and vice versa. So for the book, I'll leave it alone. If you're building an interpreter for your own language, though, you may want to consider it. Uh, many languages also allow users to provide their own native functions. The mechanism for doing so is called a foreign function interface, FFI, native extension, native interface, or something along those lines. These are nice because they free the language implementer from providing access to every single capability the underlying platform supports. Uh, we won't define an FFI for JLocks, but we'll add one native function to give you the, an idea of what it looks like. All right, so telling time. When we get to part three and start working on a much more efficient implementation of locks, we're gonna care deeply about performance. Performance work requires measurement and that in turn means benchmarks. These are programs that measure the time it takes to exercise some corner of the interpreter. We could measure the time it takes to start up the interpreter, run the benchmark and exit, but that adds a lot of overhead. Uh, th that stuff does matter, of course, but if you're just trying to validate an optimization to some piece of the interpreter, you don't want that overhead obscuring your results. A nicer solution is to have the benchmark script itself measure the time elapsed between two points in the code. To do that, a locks program needs to be able to tell time. There's no way to do that now. You can't implement a useful clock from scratch without access to the underlying clock on the computer. So we'll add clock, a native function that returns the number of seconds that have passed since some fixed point in time. The difference between two successive, successive inv invocations tells you how much time elapsed between the two calls. The function that is defined in global scope. This function is defined in global scope. So let's ensure the interpreter has access to that. So we're creating a globals. Well, let's take a look at the interpreter here. Right now, we have an environment with this double ref cell business, so we can swap it out. The first one allows us to swap it out, and the second one allows us to do um, interior immutability. So it's unfortunate, and I wish there were a way around that. It probably is. If I made all of the interpreter, if all the visit statements mutable, um, I don't know how much that would break though. So I'm not, I don't want to go there yet but maybe we, we might have to. Um, but it looks like we're gonna create this new globals, which is gonna be an environment. And then this is, run environment is gonna have a reference to the globals. Hmm. So 
So should just the globals just be a ref cell environment like that? And then this becomes the reference to globals. Is that the way we would do it in Rust? Because this would allow us, to, the ref cell would allow us to modify globals. And there's only one copy of globals. Environment field in the interpreter changes as we enter and exit local scopes. It tracks the current environment. This new globals field holds a fixed reference to the outermost global environment. All right, so should this be, should this be the ref cell? Or should the global, okay, let's, let's try it like this and see if that works. And then if not, then we'll, hmm. Let's try it like this first, <laughs> okay. And that way this that guy can just have a, a reference, a, a clone of the reference to the globals. Um, and of course now everything is gonna break, well, everything, this, this line here is gonna break because we don't have globals. So we need to create globals RC, new, ref count, new, environment, new, right? And then we can shove this clock into globals, globals.borrow mutt.define clock. Oh, okay, so new locks callable. Um, this has to be an object func of a callable, right? Let's take a look at what callable is. Let's get rid of that. Um, so callable has the function and the arity. Uh, let's make these public for now so I can just create create them here. And then we can fix that up, maybe with a callable colon colon new. So the function is going to be function is going to be what? We're going to have to create a brand new. Uh, okay, let's just throw it here, and then we can move it in a minute. Right. Um, Pump, 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 pump. What are we going to call this? Uh, native clock. And it doesn't have anything in it, right? Because we're, all we're trying to do is implement callable, the locks callable. So impl locks callable for native clock. Right, and then so we need to implement call, which is going to take self, and we don't need the interpreter. We don't need the arguments. And it's going to return a result of object or locks result and get system time. For now, I'm going to say just object num one, two, three, four, five, six. And I'll, I'll look up how to get system time in a minute. I just want to get this done. An arity of self. Returns U size. Yep, so all I have to do is return zero. Okay. It doesn't take any arguments. So we can here say func rc new native clock, like that. And arity zero. That's annoying that I have arity in multiple places now. Um, that's probably a cleaner way to do that. All right, let's see, does that build? Of course not. This opening brace doesn't match that opening brace. Oh, the, because of that, okay. Ref count doesn't exist. Oh, ref cell.
and locks callable. Yeah, so let's put that here. Use create callable and object. Expect it. Oh, this is an okay object. And then we need to put the globals in. Oh, right. That's right. We didn't finish this part here. We need to actually make the environment point to globals. So we have to do uh, rep cell new varc clone of globals. And this will be an RC clone. I don't think I can put globals here because it'll say it's, it's moved here and then we can't borrow it here, I think. Yeah, borrow of move, oops, borrow of move globals. So we, we moved it here. So we actually have to create a, a new reference to it, new oh, clone, like that. And then this one will, this reference to it will drop, but we'll still have the references here. Yeah, okay, so that worked. That's pretty exciting. Um, does it even work? Are we done? Oh no. Well, we don't have the clock value yet, but let's at least see, do we have one, two, three, four, five, six. Cargo run. This field is never read. So is that gonna not work? It didn't complain. And if I just do a random thing, it says undefined. So it found the very, oh, I know, print clock, because it returns the value. Yeah, there you go. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. So now we just need to say Rust get current system time. System time in standard time time. All right. So we're going to say we'll create a native functions. We will pull this out of the interpreter code. What else are we going to need in here? The interpreter. Um, we need object and error. All right, that's those are these guys here. I think that's everything. And then we have to put it here. Use create native functions star and then in main what is this place? pen key thank you for the follow okay and then let's see if this builds it does not oh because i missed a colon there what else callable oh i have to put callable up here as well use create What else? Native clock. I put that here, native functions. There's native clock. Oh, maybe because it wasn't building. Let's find out. Yeah, okay, we're back to two warnings and that's just the globals not being used, right? Cargo run, print clock. Good, okay, so now we have native functions. We're adding just this one, but it would be nice to be able to add a, a few more just to prove that we can do it. I mean, this is pretty straightforward. And this is this is bothering me that it's too long. This is terp and args, maybe make it shorter. Yeah, that's better. Okay, so now let's get the system time. We can get now system time now. This will get the duration. Oh, okay. Duration since Unix epoch. Okay. Let's try that. Use standard time, system time. And what we'll do is we'll say here, oh, it could error out. So let's do that, match. System time, now. 
hydration since. And if it's okay, then we're going to say object. Okay. Object num and as F64. Otherwise, error E. I wonder what, what the, what's the result type uh, from duration. Uh, duration since, right? Because that duration since returns a an error type. Um, but I'm looking for duration since and I don't see it. There it is. And system time error. I guess we could just uh, return a runtime error. Uh, error, logs error, of oh, logs result, runtime error. Oh, we don't have the. I guess we could get from the interpreter what line we're on? No, no, that doesn't keep track of the lines. I guess we'd have to come up with a brand new error type. Let's take a look at what errors are, what errors there are. Um, and our interpreter also doesn't have a line number. It has this nest. What's the nest for? Oh, that was for the break statement. That's right. Um, hmm. I guess we can create a system error. That would be cool. Right? System error. And it just has a message. result system error message e println system error something like that right and then we want to be able to build one so pub run system error Message string, box result, let error like that, and then error report. I still haven't figured out what, what's supposed to go in there. Um, that was something from like chapter three or chapter four or something like that we there was there was a there's a location business and we're not using that anywhere so it's probably time to strip that out so we have a system error clock returned invalid duration oh. to do this format bang And it's going to be this E duration business. Oh, I guess we can do it as a debug. Right, and get rid of that. Nope, we can't convert. An as expression can only be used to convert between primitive types or to coerce to a specific trait. What is n then? If it's not a... Oh, as sex. Okay. Um, pom, 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 pom. We don't want it as seconds. We want it as milliseconds though, right? Is there an as milliseconds um, in this duration? Duration returns duration. Duration has 
yeah, as oh, as millis. Okay, we can do millis, right? And that returns a U128 as millis. Here we go. All right, let's see if that works. Cargo run. Print clock. Okay. That should change. Look at that. So it's printing out as milliseconds. So this is the, the seconds, right? You can see 70, 69, 68, 68, 67, 68. Yeah, okay. I think it's working. We now have a working native clock in locks. All right, this defines a variable named clock. Its value is a Java, Java anonymous class. Well, in our case, it's actually a non-anonymous class. Can you do anonymous classes in Rust? We can do anonymous function. I know that. But can you can Rust anonymous function implement trait? I don't think you can. What do you need this for? The the question this is getting at, right, is saying you know, maybe your use case is wrong. Maybe maybe you're going down the wrong path because that's frequently a question that comes up, right? You, you ask, you, somebody asks a question and you're saying, well, you know, what you're trying to do is really hard. What do you, what's your end goal here? What are you trying to achieve? And then if somebody explains to you what they're trying to achieve, then you say, oh, you know what? Maybe you could do it this other way. But in our case, what we're trying to achieve is putting a locks callable anonymous object, I guess, that implements that trait without having to create it like this. And they say, I don't think there's something like that in Rust. Pub trait foot, impl foot for A. Yeah, I don't think you can. You can create structs inside of functions. Yes, you can, but I mean, I, so this, this could have gone inside. I could have created the struct here, but then it, in the implementation right here, instead of putting it in a separate file. So I could have done that. I guess it's the closest thing, but I think this, this way is cleaner. Uh, that way we could have, um, if we want to add more native functions, we can just go in this file and add them. So this defines a variable named clock. Clock function takes no argument, so its arity is zero. On that, yeah, that's the other thing that I'm not 100% thrilled with. Um, about this is the arity here is set to zero, but if we look when we define it in our interpreter, we're also setting the arity there to zero. Um, is that a bug in our callable struct? Because I put it here. Maybe this should be just, this should call self funk arity. Like that. Just like that thing does. And that way we can get rid of this and get rid of this. That checks. Does it still work? It does. And if I say, oops, if I say print clock one, expected zero arguments, but got one. Yeah, okay. I think that's cleaner. Section 10.2, native clock function. There we go. All right, so now we're up to function declarations. Did I read this part here? If we wanted to add other native functions, reading input from the user, working with files, etc., we could add them each as their own anonymous class that implements locks callable. But for the book, this one is really all we need. Let's get ourselves out of the function defining business and let our users take over. 
Um, yeah, I mean, it would be nice to have file read and file write and all that kind of stuff. Maybe that will be one of the challenges later. In locks, functions and variables occupy the same namespace. In common lists, the two live in their own worlds. A function and a variable with the same name don't collide. If you call the name, it looks up the function. If you refer to it, it looks up the variable. This does require jumping through some hoops when you do want to refer to a function as a first class value. Richard P. Gabriel and Ken Pittman coined the terms Lisp 1 to refer to languages like Scheme that put functions and variable in the same namespace, and Lisp 2 for languages like Common Lisp that partition them. Despite being totally opaque, these names have since stuck. Locks is, is a Lisp 1. What happens if we try to assign to it? Clock equals 5. 4. It work. Clock. Print clock. Yeah, and now it's gone. Now it's totally gone. There should be probably some protection against n overwriting native functions. <laughs> it would be nice. So because now, by just by doing that, now we've lost access to the clock function in the global namespace. Yeah, it's just it's just a. Um... Oh, I should uh, I should update this little thing to print out the globals too. Although the globals eventually get back referred back to here, right? And now it's a number. Oh, that's what I can do. Let's cargo run here. Yeah, and this is where we're putting the callable thing. You know what would be nice is if we could print out the name of it somewhere along the way. Um, maybe that'll also be a challenge that we can do. Because the name is right here, right? We can just say func clock. And we can reassign it. But we can't ever get back if we overwrite it. Maybe that should be something on the object, whether or not it's mutable. Right? I don't know if we want to add immutability to locks as a language feature, but we definitely want to prevent users from destroying now, see now it's a string. I've destroyed that function. All right. Um, function declarations. All right, section 10.3. We finally get to add new production to the declaration rule we introduced back when we added variables. Function declarations like variables bind a new name. This means they are allowed only in places where declaration is permitted. All right, so a declaration is a function declaration, or a variable declaration, or a statement. A named function declaration isn't really a sin single primitive operation. It's syntactic sugar for two distinct steps. One, creating a new function object, and two, binding a new variable to it. If locks had a syntax for anonymous functions, we wouldn't need function declaration statements. You could just do this. Yeah, this is very, uh, very similar to uh, JavaScript, right? However, since named functions are the common case, I went ahead and gave locks nice syntax for them. So this is where it becomes fun. Methods are too classy to have fun. All right, the main function declaration rule uses a separate helper rule function. A function declaration statement is the fun keyword followed by the actual function -y stuff. When we get to classes, we'll reuse that function role for declaring methods. Those look similar to function declarations, but aren't preceded by fun. Oh, I see. That's why you said methods are too classy to have fun. All right. So that's a pun on classy and a pun on fun and a pun on... Okay. The, the function itself is a name followed by the parenthesized parameter list and the body. A body is always a braced block using the same grammar rule that block statements use. So it's identifier followed by zero or more. Yeah, so this is the same the same thing we did up above uh, yesterday. It's so like the earlier arguments rule, yep. Yeah. Except that each parameter is an identifier, not an expression. That's a lot of new syntax for the parser to chew through, but the resulting AST node isn't too bad. All right, so let's add that to our, are we clean here? We are. All right, so now we have under expression, that was the wrong thing to search for. Okay, so we're gonna add function, which is gonna be a token name, a vec token, params and a vec of statement 
body. Function node has a name, a list of parameters, and then the body. We store the body as the list of statements contained inside the curly braces. Right. Over in the parser, we weave in the new declaration. Okay, let's go to the parser. Um, this is in declaration. Oh, right, we're gonna change this here. So we're gonna have else if this. So if self is match token type fun. Then we're gonna say self function, function like this. I guess, I guess that works. Like other statements, a function is recognized by the leading keyword. When we encounter fun, we call function. That corresponds to the function grammar rule since we already matched and consumed the fun keyword. That was here. We'll build up, we'll build the method up a piece at a time starting with this. So after expression statement, we're gonna add this, we're gonna consume an identifier, okay. Right here, here's expression statement. Um, it's called function and it takes a mod self and it has a string kind called kind. I'm going to say stir, so I don't have to do the two string up there. I'll do the two string down here. Uh, let name is equal to self consume. Token type. I'm just looking for another. Oh yeah, I don't you, you don't put a ampersand. Token type identifier. Expect kind name. Is that going to work? Right, because we're passing in the word function, so this should say expect function name. Will that compile? Oh, yeah, we don't have function statement anywhere. Um, I'm not worried about that issue right now. We're going to get to that, I'm sure. Um... I guess I could stub it out for now. I'm just looking to see what, what did I do wrong here? And I think I think function just isn't returning the right type. So I need to fix that. Let's stub this out for now and then come back to it. Visit function statement. Self statement. Function statement. And I'll just say object. Okay. Object nil. Oh, no, no, it's just okay. Okay, so now this should pop us over to this thing. Yeah, this has to return a result of statement or locks result. And for now, we're gonna just, uh, we can't, well, let's just make sure everything else is okay. Yep, okay, so that fixed that problem. Right now, it only consumes the identifier token for the function's name. Hora SP, hello, and thank you for the follow. You might be wondering about that funny little kind parameter. And just like we reuse the grammar rule, we'll reuse the function method later to parse methods inside classes. When we do that, we'll pass in method for kind. So the error messages are specific to the kind of declarations being parsed. Uh, next, we parse the parameter list and the pair of parentheses wrapped around it. Okay, so let's keep going here. RSP says this book is in my wish list. When do you think would be a good time to read it? Right now. Right now is the best time to start reading it. Um, yeah, I mean, if, if you're interested in it, go for it. That's what I say. No time like the present. Consume token type. So I'm just following along this, this code here. Left paren. Let me put a little blank line there. And then expect open brace after, sorry, open print after kind name, like that. Then we're gonna create a list of parameters. Let mut 
parameters equals vec new. I think he says it's great to see past streams are on YouTube. Thanks for that. Yeah, I've, I'm uploading everything to YouTube. <clears throat> I don't know if that's if that's you know best from from a uh, viewership perspective, but I don't care. I just want to archive everything. Aura says I'm definitely interested in along with a hundred other things. Really overwhelmed. Yeah, no, I I hear you. I hear you. You got you got to pick, you got to pick and choose. You you have, like you know, limited time every week to work on things, and you just gotta sit down and, and choose something. Otherwise, you just sit there doing nothing, right? So flip a coin, write a write a write a random number generator of your own, right? A pseudo random number generator, and then have it pick something for you. But that would mean learning how to write a pseudo random number generator. And that, that by itself would be an interesting learning path. Um, if not, check write paren. Right. So what we're doing here is we're looking for the open paren for the function. Uh, and then we look to make sure we haven't hit a close paren. And this is, again, a do while, which is annoying in Rust. Um, because you have to do the, the thing before you do the thing. And we did this for the arguments. Let's take a look at what we did there. Yeah, so we only need to do the add for the first one. We don't have to do the, the parameter size checking for the, for the first one. So we can just, we'll just have one line of duplicated code. Self check, who can type, right, paren. Then we're going to say parameters.push self consume token type identifier expect parameter name like that. And then we're going to say while self is match token type. Oops, sorry, we need a comma. We need to make that an array because of the like the one or two use cases where we have to match multiple things. I should fix that. I should do a match single or, or match multiple. Um, then we're going to check the parameter size, right? If um, parameters.len is greater than or equal to 55. Again, I'm going to do it the way I did it yesterday with this had error business. If not self had error. Peak two blocks results. Runtime error. Peak. Oh, this is actually a parser error, not a runtime error. We have more than 55 parameters. Um, and we're not going to actually save it anywhere. We're just going to report it in a self had error. That's true. I actually have an error now that I think about fn error. Yeah. Which does, and it has a parse error. So I should be using that instead. So let me do that. Um, self error. There we go. And then I'll look for the other 255 and fix that as well. Okay, and that means we don't have to do this part either, because that'll it sets it there for me. Okay, so then the next thing is we're gonna just do this line again. And that's the whole while loop. And then after that, we're gonna consume the right paren token type. We're not done yet. This is like the code for handling arguments in a call, except not split out into a helper method. The outer if statements statement handles the zero parameter case, and the inner while loop passes parameters as long as we find commas to separate them. Right, so while while we have a comma, then do this. 
The result is a list of the tokens for each parameter's name. Just like we do with arguments to function calls, we validate at parse time that you don't exceed the maximum number of parameters a function is allowed to have. Finally, we parse the body and wrap it all up in a function node. Okay. So then we're going to consume the left brace here. And then we're going to create a let mod body. Oh, I guess it doesn't have to be mod, right? Body is equal to self block. And then we're going to say, OK, uh, statement function. Uh, function statement, which takes a few things. What does it take? Uh, statement. There it is. So it takes a name, which you already have, um, which is the token. Uh, it takes the params, which is the parameters, and then takes the body as a, another vector. Okay, so that might be all we need to do. And then if I just rename params to parameters, Oh, um, oh, I forgot the commas here and here. There we go. Kinoa, hi. Welcome to the stream. Oh, and I put a semicolon there. It doesn't belong. Yeah, okay. So now I think if we just need, oops, rename this params. That'll allow us to get rid of this extra colon thing here. And put it all in one line. Nice. Oh, we have an error. Params. Nice. Okay. Linoa says, I've been trying to program too. Good. Have you been using websites like, like um, LeetCode or HackerRank or something like that to try to, to learn stuff? Or... You're going to a local school. Programming is fun. I can I can make that statement without qualification. Okay, I think this is everything. We do have four warnings, and that's probably because we're not using stuff. Function isn't using kind. I'm sure, it is. It's right here. Oh, 222. I need a question mark on that line. And then globals isn't being used. How is this? How is this not being used? We're, I've stuck it all over the place in here. Oh, because I'm an idiot. That's why. Thank you, Locks. I mean, thank you, Rust, <laughs> for, for letting me know. So what we need to do is this. This format. Bang. All of these guys. Then it's going to be used. Anything else? Yep, one more down here. Um, and now let's just check. See, that's in a format, that's in a format, that's in a format. That's it. Okay. Oh, right. That has to be doubled whenever you're in a format string. And it doesn't like this one either because I didn't ampersand it. Yes, 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 yes. I don't need tickle built-in commands. Uh, this needs to be ampersanded and this needs to be ampersanded. There we go. We're back down to two warnings. That's because of the globals. Hopefully we'll get there. Uh, learn, I learned it from an app called Grasshopper. Well, I haven't heard of that app. This one, learn to code for free. All right. I haven't heard of it, so I can't. I can't comment on it. I don't know how good it is. 
but hopefully it's helping you out and hopefully it's showing you how much fun coding can be. I wish you the best of luck. All right, so now that we have this, we're actually creating functions. Can we write a function in logs? Cargo run. Fun foo. Print bar. Well, it didn't complain. But there's no variable here. And saying undefined variable foo. So we can't, okay, we can't, we're not actually calling it anywhere, but it's a, we're able to parse it. So that's one step of the way. So this is 10.3, section 10.3, yeah. Get status, get add, generate and source, get commit, dash m, section 10.3, function declarations. All right, so we can now declare functions. We can't call them, but we can declare them. Function objects. We've got some syntax parts, so usually we're ready to interpret, but first we need to think, think about how to represent a locks function in Java. We need to keep track of the parameters so that we can bind them to argument values when the function is called. And of course, we need to keep the code for the body of the function so that we can execute it. Okay. That's basically what the statement function class is. Could we just use that? Almost, but not quite. Lonoa says, I learned everything from basic strings and variables to loops and if statements. Oh. Um. Oh, right. We don't want to use, we don't want the runtime phase of the interpreter to bleed into the front end's syntax classes. So we don't want statement function itself to implement that. Instead, we wrap it in a new class. So we have this class locks function, which implements locks callable. Um, and in order to implement locks callable, we need a call and an arity. Here's call. We're going to need arity somewhere. Oh, does arity by default return something? Where did we create that? Oh, it by default returns zero. Oh no, that's the clock. Yeah, so we need, oh, it's, mm, we need, mm, what am I missing? Why don't we need, oh, we do. Okay, it's just down here. I just, we just haven't gotten there yet. Okay, so it's going to take us a little while to get there. That's fine. I have a little bit of time. Klonoa says, I learned this all in just five days with no coding experience. Oh, okay. Good. <clears throat> um, all right, so let's create a new class uh, or a file, I guess, called locks function. So we can put all this stuff in here. We're going to need locks callable. Use object create object star. Use create callable star. What else do we need? Error. Use create error star. Um, pub structs locks function. Um, what is it going to take? It's going to, it needs a declaration. So we need use create because statement function comes out of our statement thing. Right. So if we, hmm, I guess we can create a new and pass in a statement, a function statement. 
I'm just trying to think how this is this supposed to work? Declaration statement function. I don't think we can do that. I think I have to say function statement, right? And then this returns a locks function or self. Uh, this, this is an impl. I'm getting ahead of myself here. Locks function. Uh, locks function. So this would require a declaration. Does this mean I need to reference count this stuff? Or this this takes a statement. Which is going to be a function statement. Hmm, I'm, I'm getting a little stuck here because we need to be able to implement this. We need to be able to pass in the, st the, the function declaration and then execute it. It looks like we're going to have to get parameters and sizes and stuff like that. And I'm a little stuck because I don't want to do that because then we have to start playing around with lifetimes. And that's going to put us, put us down a whole crazy path. Um, maybe I can reference count it and get away with it that way. Like that. Uh, self, oops. Self, like this maybe, and then... Declaration. Right, it's it worked because we're not actually using it. Main mod locks function. Yeah. Uh, RC clone. Oh, RC new. Maybe. Oh, declaration. Expected statement. Statement found. Statement. Maybe you have to pass in an RC then. And then this becomes clone. Yeah. But then how are we going to get there? So we'll implement the call of locks callable like so. So this will be, oops. Impl locks callable for locks function. Fn call self arguments vec of object and it's going to return a result of object or locks result. Right? Okay, and then we're going to create a new environment off oh off of our globals oh uh, hmm should there be a um a method on interpreter then which does that for us because we're going to create a new environment. The previous one is, how do we do that? New with, yeah, new with and closing is the way we did it. Oh, Clonoa, thank you for the follow. All right, so what do we have here? It's not self, it's this interpreter environment borrow, but this is a global, so now we have to do the borrow on, right? Um, and it is here. Oh, new within closing. Root, thank you for the follow. This takes an RC ref cell environment. 
And is that... Oh, that's exactly what globals is. Okay, so maybe we can get away with that. New within closing, just self-globals. Like that. I mean... Um, interpreter globals. Let's, let's do it like this now. I'll make this pub for now, and then we'll maybe fix it later. Maybe, he says. And then for... Um, we do this with a zip in Rust, right? For um, parameters and arguments in self declaration params zip. Oh, params um, iter zip arguments iter. Something like that. Let's see if that works. And then we can say e dot borrow mut dot define um, p dot uh oh how did we do defines and we do it like this p dot as a string and then a let's say parameter and org so I can read it like that something like that and then self interpreter no just interpreter execute block self declaration body environment and then return null really return null how do we do function calls then? Uh, how do we return stuff? Okay, object. I mean, I thought that functions would have to return something, but okay. Let's see how much this blows up. Um, we need interpreter. An environment. This is just E. Expected vec found reference. Oh, is this supposed to be like this? And missing arity. Okay, so we're getting there. Function arity, self, new size. Um, I'm just gonna stub that out to zero for now because I know we're gonna get to it later. Okay, declaration params. is supposed to be in declaration. Oh, you know what? It's because I did this business with statement. Uh, if let some function statement, and I have to look it up now. We have to destructure it here, name, params, and body. Maybe not the sum, not the, yeah, is equal to self declaration. Then we have all these guys. And we get rid of this. And we get rid of this. And we don't need the name, since I don't see it anywhere else. We have a runtime error. Box error. Runtime error. Um, oh, runtime error. We, we need something in here. I'm going to say panic then. <laughs> That's the easiest way out of it. Uh, locks created a callable on a non function statement object. That's how we get out of that problem. And it doesn't like this one. 
This expression has type RC statement. Do I have to deref it? Nope, that's not the problem. Oh, it's because I do have to call it name. Expected, oh, uh, statement function. Maybe like this. Yeah, okay. That works. Oh, hi, Zeta Numbers. How are you? We're just wending our way through this thing here. Method not found. Oh, because this is a direct environment. So. Arg doesn't work. Arg is an expected enum object found uh, a reference to an O. Well, it's an object. I can just call it. Boom. Done. Ha. Huh. And then execute block is a private associated function. So this needs to be a public function then. And there we go. Um, I'm not sure Twitch live lover if you're a spammer or not, but if you continue along that line, you will get blocked. Oh, there we go. And we're blocked. Thanks, but no thanks. Um, and there should be a way to delete the message too. Uh, I don't see how. Anyway. Uh, hopefully those those messages are deleted. I can't tell from my mod screen. Um, where well, I was, I'm lost now. I got a reset. All oh, right, we're trying to make execute block a um, public function, so we can execute it from outside. All right, now what's wrong? Oh, now we have a move. Hmm. Oh, we can just clone it, right? RC clone, like that, because it's a, it's a uh, it's already an RC, right? Yeah. Okay. Messages are gone. Says data numbers. Thank you. doing okay so this should now be able to create this stuff um i don't know if this is going to work i mean i was just this is one of those situations where you, you write the code the way you think it should be and then you hope that you're banging it into shape as you're fighting the compiler uh, this handful of lines of code is one of the most fundamental powerful pieces of our interpreter Oh boy, that gives me full confidence. As we saw in the chapter on statements and state, managing name environments is a core part of a language implementation. Functions are deeply tied to that. Parameters are core to functions, especially the fact that a function encapsulates its parameters. No other code outside of the function can see them. This means each function gets its own environment, right? That's what we created here, where it stores those variables. Further, this environment must be created dynamically. Each function call, each function call gets its own environment, otherwise recursion would break. If there are multiple calls to the same function in play at the same time, each needs its own environment, even though they are all calls to the same function. Right. I, I, I get this all, so I, I don't want to read through this, but it's basically saying, you know, this n has to be its own private n, and the call here to count of n minus one has to be its own n, uh, its own separate n to, for that function call, right? That's why we create a new environment on each call, not on declaration. Right, and then we have to bind all the variable names. Call tells the interpreter to execute the body of the function, that's what we're doing here, in this new function local environment. Up until now, the current environment was the environment where the function was being called. Now we teleport from there inside the new parameter space we've created for the function. This is all that's required to pass data into the function. By using different environments when we execute the body, 
calls to the same function with the same code can produce different results. Perfect. Once the body of the function is finished executing, execute block discards that function local environment, right? That's happening in here. What we're doing is we're doing a replace with the new environment. We run the current interpreter with the new environment, and then we put the previous environment back into place. I think that all makes sense. Uh, finally, the call returns null, which returns nil to the caller. We'll add, oh, okay, we're gonna add returning values later. Very good. Mechanically, the code is pretty simple. Walk a couple of lists, bind some new variables. That's what we did here, right? In this little loop. This is one of my favorite snippets in the entire book. Feel free to take a moment to meditate on it if you're so inclined. And hopefully I got zip in the right order. Um, I can never remember what order zip goes, whether this params goes here or it goes, or is it, uh, we'll, we'll find out. Okay, are we done? Are we done meditating? Hopefully. Note that when we bind the parameters, we assume the parameter and argument lists have the same length. This is safe because visit call expert checks the arity before calling call. It relies on the function reporting its arity to do that. Oh, and this is where we're going to put this. So we're going to say declaration uh, self. Oh, and we have to destructure it again. Dang it. I'm going to have to look to see if there's a better way to do this. Like that. And then we're going to just say return param size. Um, params.len else panic created uh, callable on a non function statement object. Let's, let's try this. Lux looked for the arity. There. Okay, we're down to six warnings. Um, that's most of our object representation. While we're in here, we may as well implement to string. Oh, okay, we can do that. Um, ooh, if we want to implement to string on. Okay, so let's take a look at object. All right, this is the way we're implementing to string right now, but maybe we want to have callables to string function right so let's go over to callable and have it implement to string or should it be on the trait <laughs> hmm Impulse display Recallable. And then the trait itself can have a uh, two string. Like that. And then we'll have to implement it for all of them. Right. And then the display for callable just becomes. Um, this and then write f self to string um, and what is this going to return though self funk to string Why do we have this in direction then? Oh, we need the um, core format display. And this doesn't have two strings, so let's add that real quick. So function to string on itself, string. Um, we're gonna return this thing. I don't like this anymore. I don't like this setup anymore because of the way we have to destructure it each time. This is going to be name as string. 
right? And then, oh, what am I missing? There's something I, I was thinking, oh, I have to do this before I do the other thing, and now I don't remember what it is. Oh, here, and here we go, function to string. This is where we get the clock. Um, string like this, and then we can just return um, native. What's the, what was the error? Multiple to string found. Oh no. Yeah, so this is callables to string. And then there's the trait to string. Oh dear. So how do we handle that? Let's just call this name. Oh, we can't. Um, we have to call something else name. Where's the Where's the other one? We have callable locks callable is the associated function. Oh, and then we have two string. So we actually have to call the one that we we want. I see. Um, so we have to say callable, or we can say locks callable here. I shouldn't have called it too string then, right? <sighs> oh, name as string doesn't return a string. What does it return? It returns an ampersand string. That's kind of annoying, right? As string and then into. And now we have eight warnings. All right. Does any of this work? Um, actually, what we can do is say cargo run. Oh, I can just ignore it by putting an underscore. Okay. No, it still says callable here. Oh, because I didn't fix the uh, object, right? Oh, no, it's not there. Source callable. Unlocks callable to string on self. And now cargo run at. Yeah, okay, now it, it shows it's it got the native uh, clock function interpreted uh, in implemented. All right, and I'll change all these names to underscores because we don't need them anywhere. Except for there. Um, these we don't need. And this we don't need. Now we have 15 errors. Wow. But it told me to do that. Oh, Porky the Black. Hi, how are you? Root says, how do you open another file while working on a current file for reference? The terminal gets divided into two horizontal sections. I'm new to Vimp. Okay, so yeah, let's, let's go down to one window here. So if I say Control W S, that does a split, a horizontal split. There's probably a vertical split. Um, yes, it's the Vim split. So Control W S does a split. Control W O closes all but the window your the cursor is in, and you can split multiple times. I can hit Control. So now I got five of them. And if I hit quit on that one, it closes one. If I hit Control W, see the Control W at the bottom there? Then O, it closes all but that one. Um, but I'm going to do a cargo check real quick here and see. It says help by you know, try ignoring the field. Name, oh, I have to say name colon underscore like that? That's annoying. 
Okay, now I definitely want to fix all this because uh, this is ugly as hell. Okay, we still have three warnings. We're not using new. Oh yeah, because we're not creating locks functions yet. And then this has a result that must be used on line 37. So I'm going to do that instead. Instead of returning nil. There we go. Oh, it didn't like it. So I'm just going to put a question mark. There. Done. Nope, it still doesn't like it. As a result, maybe an error variant which should be handled. Can I just put that with the question mark? Yeah, and this returns a locks result. I don't know what's going on there. Oh no, it's done. It's fixed. Okay, good. All right, um, and now I have to wrap things up because I am out of time. Uh, so we, we're not going to actually get to... Oh, let's see if we can toss this in here. This this is pretty straightforward, right? Let's do this real quick. This is inside our interpreter. And visit function statement, right? This is the thing I stubbed out earlier. So we say... Oops. Statement is going to be this function statement. Let function is equal to locks function new statement. Uh, I'm cringing because I'm not sure that's going to work. And then environment self environment dot borrow dot borrow mute uh, dot define statement name as string and function is that gonna work i don't know and then return no so then just okay like that and then we have to call it right maybe not we do have an error we don't have locks function use create locks function Two errors. Statement is expecting an RC, so RC new. Just like that. Oh. Oh no. Do all of these need to be RC'd now? Or just this one guy? Uh oh. the other error. yeah i oh, expected a new object found locks oh right because we have to create it as a function this is object func function something like that expected callable callable found locks function oh no all right i have to make it callable and then say func function I don't know why I'm fixing this one when the, the other one isn't going to work. Expected RCO. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I fixed that problem, but now we, we have another problem where we can't, we can't create this because it's expecting a statement, but found a reference to a statement. And clone. Yeah. And that's going to say it doesn't implement the copy, copy trade or something like that. Oh, no, no. This is saying it found a function statement it was expecting. Oh, wait. Is that what the error is then? Yeah, I expected a statement but found this. Hmm. So where, where do we go from here? We have the statement that this was wrapped in. 
right? Because we we destructured it. If we look here at our statement code, we destructured it. We have the statement, and we say we destructure it to this thing, and we call accept, and then accept calls visit. Where is it? Visit function statement on function statement. So does it make sense to revisit this whole entire kerfuffle and make it uh, and I don't have time to do that not today I was hoping to be able to call functions is there another way we can do locks locks function because this is this is all ugly right having to destructure the statement thing can I make this a function statement But this is still going to have a ref in there, isn't it? Hmm. And then I have to clean up all of this. I mean, which wouldn't be that hard, but is that going to? OK, let, let's let's clean that up. Right, and then this is going to be declaration dot body, and this just needs the params. Get rid of these guys, and then this just needs the name. It's self declaration. It does make it look cleaner. Um, oh, expected. What's this? Expected. Oh, okay. So we can just do that. All right. So now we're up to the part where we expected a function statement but found a reference to a function statement. So clone. This is where I get all bothered. No, I can't. It's still doing a move, it's still doing a blah. And if I change the other thing to be a ref, then we, then we get into lifetimes and then I die. Oh, what can we do here? I mean, the other, the other option would be to pass in RCs for all of these guys, but that would mean changing all this code. Um, it wouldn't actually mean changing all that much. But something my brain isn't ready for uh, right now. So I'm going to wrap this up unfortunately I'm leaving it here in the middle of brokenness we, we're down to one error or we can't do this to do um, and we'll, we'll I'll have to think about this offline and then we'll figure it out tomorrow because I, I really was hoping uh, just to finish up 10.4 all right I'm gonna leave it there I'm going to push these changes, even though they're they're broken. Let's do this. Get add source. Commit. Almost done with 10.4. Need to refactor function statement. All right, pushing these up, calling it a stream. Sorry guys, we're leaving it in the middle like this. And uh, tomorrow we're definitely going to finish 10.4. I'll figure out a better way to approach this thing. Yeah, we'll figure out a better way to approach this issue and then we will, um, um, you know what, I'm just thinking, let's, let's, let's see if we can just edit it real quick. I'll comment this out so we don't generate a new file each time. 
can I just hack this in here? Oh, RC. Like that. And then visit function statement is going to take um, RC new of self. This has to be okay. Oh, not found, so use standard RC, RC. And this this takes an RC, a function statement. It doesn't like this. Oh, because self is ampersanded. All right, so that failed. So even if we even if we did it this way, right, it's going to fail. Yeah, because it needs. So I, all I do is push the problem down to the next layer. So that doesn't help. So doing all that doesn't help. Get the check out. Okay. All done. Let's call it a stream. Uh, thanks for hanging out with me. And then hopefully tomorrow um, we'll be able to figure out the right way to approach this function statement business. And then uh, we'll work on return statements. Right. So we'll leave it there. All right. Thanks again, everyone. And I will uh, see you tomorrow. Have a good one.